God speaks to us in many different ways. And so the way he spoke to Paul was through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The way he spoke to Samuel may have been through Jesus. It may have been through the Father. But it was a voice that he could hear to where he actually thought that it was Eli, the high priest. And so it's really important for us to understand the importance of the, conv of the conviction of the Holy Spirit and how God wants to speak to us. And so conviction is his way. It's, it's one of his primary methods today that he speaks to us. Of course, the word of God, I would say, is probably the primary way that God speaks to us. But the Holy Spirit, through conviction, can get a hold of us and get, us, get our attention. Conversion is the result when we give in to conviction. When he convicts us, he's trying to bring a change in some kind of way. God wants to bring a change because we're moving in a direction that maybe we're not supposed to be going. Uh, maybe we made a decision that we should not have made. Maybe there's a remedy that he's bringing to us. And so through conviction, he wants to bring conversion. He wants to bring a change. Whether it's a conversion, a complete and total conversion of your whole life, or a conversion of just that direction you're going, he wants to bring a change. And what comes after that is he goes from conviction to comfort. The Holy Spirit is not just the convictor, but he's also Amen. the comforter. Yes. He wants to comfort us. But the problem is, is if you're constantly, if I am constantly resisting the Holy Spirit, then I cannot possibly have the comfort mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit because he is a persistent spirit. Amen. He is one who is very, very diligent and he will continue to deal with us. He will continue his dealings. Thank God yes. that he is very persevering. He is very long suffering and he will continue to deal with us and, and work on our hearts until we finally give in and we allow the change to take place, which leads to the peace. Thank you, Lord. Yes, the peace that we all want. But the thing is that there are so many people out there. There is a man, I can relate so much to this, that we, when we resist the Holy Spirit, I can relate in a big way. When, when I just wanted to do something, I just wanted to go in a certain direction. It was sinful. It was ungodly. It was very, very wrong. And I just decided in my mind that I was just going to go and I was going to do things my way. I was irritated. I was frustrated. I was so disgusted. And, and there were times in that period, in those periods, where I didn't realize that it was the conviction of the Holy Spirit and my resistance to it that was making me so frustrated, that was making me so irritated, so irritable. There's a message that God is trying to get across to us. There's a theme message, but then within the theme message, there are other messages and things that God is speaking to us. And it really is important for us to understand that when we start to feel that pricking inside, that tugging inside, and then sometimes it's more, it's more than just a subtle tugging, but it's a very irritable feeling because we're resisting at times. God had a relationship with Adam and Eve in the garden. And so through that relationship, Sin came in in the garden and Adam and Eve, we know the story. I think most everybody knows the story of what happened and how uh, Eve was tempted by the serpent who was Satan and then to eat from the fruit of the tree that they were told not to eat from. So she ate, she gave it to Adam who was already with her. So in my mind, in my visual of that, he was there watching her. He was like letting her be the test subject. He was saying, hey, I'm gonna see what's gonna happen to her first before I eat that fruit, you know? And then he goes ahead and he eats the fruit because she gave it to him who was with her, right? And so then the relationship is broken. They're put out of the garden. They're not able to walk and talk with God and have that tight relationship that they once had. And then thousands of years later, he sends his son, Jesus Christ. And, and it needs to be explained and understood that although he's referred to as the son of God, he is God. He is not just uh, a baby that came to earth who, uh, and we know that he was, and that God, you know, put his uh, put his seed in 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 uh, Mary, and then she gave birth to Jesus. It, it's not just that he was just a man, but he actually was and is God. And so we can see that he is God throughout Scripture. In the Book of Revelation, in chapter five, uh, the the John's talking about the book of the seven seals of what's going to happen in the future when these seals are going to be opened up 
And we're going to start to see tribulation. And we're going to start to see the workings of the Antichrist and the things that he's going to do. There's seven seals, but within the first five seals, you actually see some definitive things that are going to happen that are going to be the workings of the Antichrist and Satan, the dragon, and everything that he's going to do. But John wanted to be able to see what is in the book. I want to know what those seals are. But there was no one in his vision in this experience there was no one that they could find initially that was worthy to open the book they were looking for someone but they weren't looking for an angel they weren't looking for for uh, any other creature but a man they wanted to find a man god wanted a man to come and take the book out of the hand of the one who sits on the throne the father is seated on the throne he holds the book and according to Revelation, the book was in his hand and there was no one who was able to take it out of his hand. They looked and there was no one on earth. There was no one in heaven. There was no one under the earth. And they were wanting to know how the 24 elders wanted to know how are we going to know? John wanted to know how are we going to be able to know what the seals are in this book? And he wept and it really disturbed him. He was highly upset over this. And then and then. It was made known that there is a man. Yes. There is a man who is worthy. Now, there could be many different uh, interpretations as to exactly what that meant. But Jesus was the only one who was worthy to walk up. Maybe he was already there because the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 2, that he's seated. He's already seated at the right hand of the Father. But there is only one man who is worthy to take that book out of the hand of the one who sits on the throne to take that book out of the hand of the father and he is worthy to open the book and he was described at first as the lion of the tribe of judah and then in the very next verse or two it goes on to say that he is the lamb of god the lion of the tribe of judah is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he gives us a perfect picture to understand exactly who this person is. This person is Jesus Christ. And we know that he is God because when he was tempted by Satan, Satan told him, if you'll bow down, if you'll fall on your face, bow down and worship me right here and right now. He said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. And Jesus quoted the scripture and said to him, you already know. Thou shalt not, sir, thou shalt not worship, thou shalt worship the Lord your God only, and him only shalt thou serve. And so back to Revelation, they began to sing a song. Yes. They bowed down before Jesus and they worshiped him. Yes. And when they sang this song, the song of the Lamb, the song of the redeemed. They were glorifying and they were honoring the one who was worthy to take that book yeah. out of his hand. Thank and you. that is another example. That is another proof where there's many throughout the Bible that Jesus is more than just a son of God. Yeah. He is more than just a mere man that came down and was born through Mary, the virgin. But he actually is God yes. because there is no other that should be worshipped. There is no other that should be bowed down to. No one should, should be sung to in such a manner where there's such great honor and such worth and such uh, glory. Amen. And so that we can see. But Jesus had to come down for his 33 and a half years of ministry, go to the cross and perform his work at the cross. He had to endure the cross. The Holy Spirit's work, it works in agreement with what Jesus did at the cross. So the Holy Spirit is the one who delivers what Jesus paid for, delivers to Thank us. Jesus. Those who are saved, he delivers it to us. He gives us the grace so that we can truly walk and live as the redeemed. We can truly live a life of a new creation, yes. not just live the life of a new creation. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And that's the work that the Holy Spirit does. But Jesus did work. Jesus did many miracles. He performed all kinds of mir miracles. He taught all kinds of great, deep parables and teachings and preachings and things that um, 
back then they didn't fully understand everything and especially a lot of the parables which there wasn't always an understanding there wasn't always an explanation I think there's only two parables I believe where he actually gives the interpretation and even after the interpretation there are some things that you may not be 100% clear exactly what it means but he said in John chapter 4 verse 12 he said verily verily I say to you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, will he do also. And greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. Why? Because I go to my Father. And so it's important to be saved. We must know that we have to believe on him, and we have to believe on his work. I'm not talking about the works that he was just talking about so much as we do need to believe that he performed those miracles. We need to believe that he is who he said he was. If he is God, then of course the recordings of his miracles are true, but we need to believe on him and his finished work, his, his greatest work that he ever yeah. performed, that he ever did was going to the cross. Yeah. We have to believe that and we have to know that. And so he said in that scripture that he was going to the Father. And so when he ascended into heaven, he went to the throne. And he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And he said that we can do greater works, even greater works than what he did. He told his disciples, he told his apostles that he wanted them to do even greater. The word expedient there in that verse of scripture actually means better. So he wanted us to do better works. He said, it, it, is, it is expedient for you that I go away. It was better that he goes away. Because if he did not go away, then the Holy Spirit would not be sent. And the Holy Spirit has his own qualifications as to what he does. The Holy Spirit has all of the qualifications of God because the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit has absolutely no limitations. Now, I know it may sound a little odd, but Jesus had his limitations. Jesus was limited to a physical, fleshly body. Today, or, or should I say after he ascended into heaven, when he appeared to, the, to Saul before he became Paul, he had that limitation that, that he allowed on himself to where he appeared to him in a vision. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, he is another person of the triune Godhead. There are three in one that make one God. Um, so the Holy Spirit can be over in Asia, can be in Africa, can be right here, can be in hundreds and thousands of people all at the same time speaking something to, to you and speaking something to me at the very same time. That's the awesome power of the Holy Spirit and his work and his qualification and his where there is no limitation as to what yes. he can do. Now, I, I brought something tonight, and I want you to know that this cost me about $2.95. Uh, this is just a replica of the Constitution of the United States. And this is something that the Lord has, all, has, has recently put on my heart, so I didn't steal it. I mean, there's no way I could ever accomplish that. And it was very cheap, but I thought it was kind of cool. I bought this years ago in New York City. Uh, when I was visiting there, and I just thought it was really cool. But I wanted to talk to you just briefly about what I consider to be a constitutional crisis that we have in our country. We have a constitutional crisis here. You do realize, if you're an American, I hope, you know, I shouldn't say it like that because I didn't fully understand uh, the authority of the Constitution from, for probably most of my adult life, but as Americans, we need to know that this is the highest authority you realize this is the highest authority in our government. This is higher than the Supreme Court. You realize that? This is what the Supreme Court is supposed to be upholding. This is higher than the Senate. This is higher than Congress. This is higher than the authority of the governors. This is higher than the authority of mayors. This is higher than any other authority, I'm talking about human authority, that is in our country. Judges, I'm talking about circuit judges, I'm talking about state judges, the state Supreme Court, the federal Supreme Court. It doesn't matter what branch of government on the federal level, the state level, the local level. Their job is to uphold this right here. And when they get out of line, this is to summon them and say, no, this is the highest authority. Now, I really don't qualify to talk about COVID-19, but I think I qualify to talk about this. 
And I know that doctors, the CDC, Dr. Fauci, and all these others associated with, with, with what you would consider to be the medical authorities, the WHO, which is supposed to be a, a global organization that has some sort of supposed authority, but they don't have the authority to step into our country and tell us what our rights are and what we can exercise. Amen. It was one thing to make a suggestion for a couple of weeks that we stay home for our own good, to see what's going to happen as time goes on. But this right here says, no, you don't have the authority to make it a mandate and say you have to stay home. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on that because, like I said, I am in no fashion qualified to talk on a deep level about COVID-19. But what I do know is I want to make a comparison to this. Amen. This is our Constitution. Yes. This is our highest authority. The Holy Bible, the Word of God. This is the highest authority that we have. Yeah. And in this Bible, just like in the Constitution, it talks about the different branches of government. But in this Bible, it actually tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And if you go to Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, this Bible here in the book of Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. For what? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, God gave us every one of them, just like our Constitution, the framers of our country, the framers of the Constitution, the framer of this word. We could say the framers, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The framers of this Constitution, of this Bible, gave us those offices, gave us all of them. But when they step out of line and they are not following this here, they're not following the word of God. The word of God summons them yes. and calls them into question. The word of God summons them and calls them to repentance. The word of God summons them and calls them for correction, for their doctrine to be straightened out, for there to be some correction and some reproof. And we have a, a crisis in the body of Christ. Yes. It's been going on for really thousands of years. It really has. Because there's so much false doctrine out there that's been adhered to. There's so much false doctrine out there that's not being followed. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit will always follow the authority of God's Amen. Word. That's how we can test a spirit. That's how we can test a message that's being taught or preached. That's how we can test a pastor or a teacher or a prophet or an evangelist or an apostle if there should be one. We can always test it by the authority of God's Word. It, Romans 8 1 says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk who do not walk according to the flesh but walk according to the spirit conviction we already know is the work of the Holy Spirit the condemnation if there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ that will be us we're in Christ we've accepted Jesus we have become saved we're in Christ. So if there's no condemnation in Christ and conviction is the work of the Holy Spirit, then whose work is the work of condemnation? Condemnation is the work of Satan. And you can see it in Scripture. You can see it in the Bible. But before I get into the story of the quick, brief story, I want to just contrast briefly the Holy Spirit and Satan. Holy Spirit's qualifications is that he has no limitations. Satan's qualification is that he has absolute limitation. He can only be in one place at one time. So to think that when I feel condemned that it's Satan himself condemning me, that would not be exactly correct. But it could be a principality. It could be a power. It could be my own conscience. It could be the guiltiness of the sinfulness of something that I'm involved in. But an evil spirit, a demon spirit... I guess it could be even a fallen angel possibly, but whatever the case, I'm just trying to make the point that Satan himself is probably not the one that's trying to condemn Aaron, okay? I don't consider myself that much of a threat. 
Uh, I guess it's possible, but I don't think it's probable. So conviction and condemnation, they're both forms of judgment. And conviction is a judgment that the Holy Spirit works. Condemnation is a form of judgment, but it's a judgment that Satan and his kingdom works on people. Okay, And so it's a mini form of judgment. It's inside of a person. Conviction is a judgment to let you know, hey, I'm giving you this judgment so that you don't have to be appeal and go before a higher judgment, a higher uh, authority that could be very, very consequential. And conviction will always seek to eternally restore us when we're away from God. It gives life and it delivers power to make an eternal amend to whatever has been broken or violated. That's the thing, no matter what we do, no matter how screwed up we are, no matter how badly we screw things up, His mercy, His love, His presence, His conviction, it stays with us, it stays on us, it stays at us, and it never stops until we give in or until we stop breathing on earth. That's what the Holy Spirit does. I'm not saying it's not possible that the Holy Spirit would ever pull away because there is scripture that talks about that, but I really can't get into that right now. Condemnation, on the other hand, seeks to eternally separate us from God. It seeks to destroy and bring an eternal end. That's what Satan wants for us. He wants to bring us to a final end. He knows his end is coming. He knows He's well aware of the Word of God. That's why he was so, uh, so effective in distorting it and twisting it to Eve. Because he knew the Word of God. He knew the command that God had already given about the tree. There's an example of condemnation. Let's look at Judas just briefly. You, you already know the story, I, I would assume, but in Matthew 27, 3. In Matthew chapter 27, Verse 3. We can see where it says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw he was condemned, he repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now there was something very serious going on. And, and I, I'm sure a lot of you already know uh, this other verse of scripture that I'm going to go to. But what was happening is Satan. Okay, he saw that Jesus was condemned. But the irony was Judas was feeling his own condemnation. Look at the source he went to to try to make things right. Mm -hmm. That's good. Isn't that pretty messed up? He went to the very ones who were a part of this evil agenda to get Jesus crucified, to get him out of the way, to shut down everything that Jesus was. And that's who Judas went. The ones he paid the money, the 30 pieces of silver, to betray Jesus. He went back to them to try to restore, if you could call that a feeble attempt to try to restore something. Whatever it was that drew Judas in the first place to follow Jesus. Maybe there was some sincerity in the beginning, and I believe that there was. But how much he truly surrendered, how much of his heart he truly surrendered, he ended up at this place. But if we look back a little bit further in the story, in John chapter 13, verses 23, uh, 27, excuse me. In John 13, 27, it shows where Satan entered into Judas. So condemnation, you can believe it. It was at work in Judas after he betrayed Jesus. And he, he had to have been close by. It says when he saw that Jesus was condemned. When he saw that he was already condemned. It was a done deal. If you remember the story, uh, the other story of Peter, another disciple, another follower of Jesus, he was nearby too. Judas was nearby to see that he was condemned, but Peter was nearby while he was denying Jesus. Yes. And so you see the work of condemnation in Judas, but you see on the other hand, we're going to see the work of conviction 
the conviction of the Holy Spirit in Peter. In Luke chapter 22, verses 61 through 62, it says, And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he said unto him, Before the cock crow, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. So after Peter denied Jesus the third time, after he denied him the third time, what I love about this passage in Luke, because there's other parallel passages in the Gospels, but this one, what's so beautiful about this one was that the Lord turned and looked on Peter. And in my mind, this is just my visual, I see Peter making eye contact with Jesus. <laughs> That's just more of the way I perceive it. But Jesus looked on him when the cock crew, he denied him three times consecutively, right in a row. And then Peter realizes, my God, he told me this was going to happen. I am such a filthy scumbag. I don't even deserve And he just started crying, weeping bitterly. I imagine when you're weeping bitterly, you can hear it. Yes. I imagine when you're weeping bitterly, it's going to either be repentance or just absolute total devastation. But in his case, we know it led to repentance yeah. when, he, when he ran away. In Luke twenty-two thirty-one 31 through 32 is where Jesus tells Peter what's going to happen. Peter says, I would never, I would never... I would never deny you. I would never do such a thing. And it's so easy for me to put myself in that situation. And I could see myself saying something like that, especially in my younger years, in my young adult years as a, as a follower of Christ. I, I was very, very passionate about God. And, and I had that kind of a mindset, that kind of an attitude. And so easily I would fall. So easily I would fall into sin and I would do things that... That, that I should not be doing. And so here Jesus tells him, don't worry, I'm going to pray for you. The devil, Satan, he wants to sift you as wheat. He wants to have you. You see how it's worded there? That he may sift you, he's desired to have you. That he may sift you as wheat. See, Satan wants to have us. He wants us to be all his own. So that he can do what he wants. So that his kingdom can do what they want yeah, to us. So that they can destroy us. So that they can do what was done to Judas. Mm -hmm. The difference between Peter and Judas is that Peter was operating behind the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Where Judas was operating behind the possession of Satan. Mm -hmm. Satan already had Judas. He wanted to have Peter. That was the difference. Yes. I can assure you that Satan just didn't just take him by force without him yielding, yes. without Judas giving it to him. That's right. Mm -hmm. There's no way Jesus was going to let one of his disciples be just taken from him like that. No, Judas was willing, and Judas gave himself willingly. Satan wanted to have Peter, but he already had Judas. The thing about Peter is that God, God wants to work in us. He wanted to work in Peter first so that afterwards he could work through Peter. God wants to work in you so that afterwards he can work Amen. through you. And so Peter, there were still some things in Peter that were not quite right. He was not ready to go and preach the gospel on the street, streets after Jesus was raised from the dead and after Jesus would actually... Uh, go back and appear to them. I think it was for about 40 days and then eventually he would ascend to heaven and then Peter would be the first recorded to preach a message. The message that he preached where 3,000 and then 5,000 got saved and then uh, go, that's the Jews, right? And then going to the house of Cornelius, the Gentiles yes. and preaching the first recorded message to the Gentiles. It's almost like God gave him a key. But I'm going to leave it right there. And so frustration is the result of conviction when it's unanswered. Unanswered conviction leads to frustration. Does your frustration lead to flesh frustration? <laughs> Does your frustration lead to flesh frustration like Judas and you just completely flesh out and give in completely and, and 
destruction at the end? Or does your frustration like Peter lead to prostration? Mm. Where you bow before him, you give in to him, and you let the conviction take its completion. Go to the full end of that little judgment, that big little judgment that's going on on the inside of you. Conviction calls us. Conviction will always, in some fashion or form, it will call us to the cross. It will call us to the cross of Jesus Christ. Why? That we might conform to the image of His Son. Yes. Romans 8, 29. Whatever you or I might be convicted of, that conviction is for a change, like we talked about earlier. It's for a change so that we might have peace, because without having peace, I can't preach the gospel. I can't share Jesus with people. I cannot have God work through me if I don't have peace in yes. me. So God wants to work in me so that in return He can work through me. That's what God wants to do. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren, those called for His purpose. These are the ones who are called according to His purpose. For what purpose? That we might be conformed to the image of that we might be conformed to the image of the Father's Son. Yes. If I'm conformed to the image of the Father's Son, if I'm conformed to the image of the Lamb of God, then at some point in time, I have to get up off of my, my, my seat and I have to go tell somebody. I have to do the works that Jesus did. Yes. I have to do the work that He's called me to do. Romans 6 You can go there, Manny, but I, I moved a little too quick on that when I jumped the gun. It happens. Conviction is not the righteousness of God. I want to make it clear because um, although I'm being convicted, it doesn't mean that, that that in and of itself is the righteousness of God. It's actually a call to the righteousness of God. Conviction is the Holy Spirit calling me to His righteousness, yes. calling me to make something right that may be wrong. It's an urgent call. That's why the Holy Spirit will continue to convict until we give in. He will Sometimes He'll pull away and He'll give us a time or a season and then He'll come back and He'll convict again over the same thing or things again and again. Conviction points us to the righteousness of God. It is the hand of God at work in the heart of man. Romans 6, 16-17 Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Obedience from the heart is what the Holy Spirit is pulling us toward. Obedience from the heart. It's an internal thing. Conviction is internal, and obedience comes from an internal place. It comes from the heart. You know, if you have a child, then you know that when... There's been times when you tell them to do something, and you have to put pressure on them to do that something, and they decide, okay, it's better to just do what they say because they're getting angry. I'm about to get a, a whipping or something. And they go and they do it with their lip dragging on the ground. They're not doing it from the heart. They're doing it because they have to. They're doing it because they know you have the strength to, to make them do it. They know that your love has teeth. It has a bite. And so they do it. And so what he's talking about here in that scripture is obedience from the heart. No, I'm not reluctant. I'm not hesitant. I want to obey. I want to do it because not only do I know that you can force me in some way, but it's going to help me. You're doing it because you love me. You're doing it because it is going to help me. How is it, talking about the conviction of the Holy Spirit, how is it that something so irritating could possibly accomplish something so beautiful. Because the conviction of the Holy Spirit leads us to a place where we can have peace. The irritating conviction of the Holy Spirit leads us to a place where we can have comfort and we can have peace. And how is it that that could be? I was thinking about this many days ago and it came to me in this way, just like an illustration. 
It's like the irritating grain of sand that makes its way inside an oyster. That oyster puts up layers over layers over layers over that one little grain of sand. Some believe it's the oyster's defense mechanism to spew out the irritant. There's differences of opinions on those who study oysters. But then there's others who believe that those layers that are being put up over this irritant actually mean that the oyster is not trying to defend and trying to push away, but trying to embrace the irritant. The oyster, I think it can be both ways. The oyster is actually embracing the irritant, putting layers over layers over layers, until one day it becomes, this irritant turns into a pearl of great price. And I believe that it can be resistance because not all oysters produce pearls. You've got saltwater oysters, you've got freshwater oysters. You've got the ones in the freshwater that usually the ones you're going to find the pearls and they don't always produce pearls. And when they do produce pearls, they're not always perfect. And they're not always the most elegant and the most beautiful. But you can resist it and it can keep the pearl from being produced or you can embrace it. And you can allow it to do its work, and it does produce something of great beauty. Moments and days and years of irritating conviction. If we'll just give in to the Holy Spirit, the conviction will leave for a time until the next episode, and then the Holy Spirit comes back and He convicts of something else. It's a relationship that just goes on and on. It's a relationship with God. Where Jesus already did his work, God the Father, he sits on the throne and he watches over everything. And the Holy Spirit continues, continues, he continues, day in and day out, he continues to do his work, Praise to God. convict you, to wake you up in the night, to give you a dream when he needs to communicate sometimes, to give you a vision. When he wants to communicate. The Bible talks about how prophets, their calling, it comes with visions and it comes with dreams. You see it with many of the prophets that we look at in the Bible. If you're a person that might have a prophetic ministry in your life, you might get visions and dreams like that on a regular basis. The thing about this oyster and the grain of sand and the pearl that it potentially could produce is that when Jesus was on the cross, he saw you as that pearl of great price. But the fact of the matter for me is that when I surrendered to Jesus at the foot of the cross, I realized that no, it was Jesus and it was what He did at the cross. That was the pearl of great price. That was the true pearl of great price. Matthew 13, 45 through 46 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. And that's what Jesus did. He gave all that he had when he came down to earth so that we could, we, he could leave and he could send the Holy Spirit to come and convict and lead us and guide us and bring us into the place where we could have a life that represents a pearl, a beautiful pearl to him in his eyes. Amen. Do not resist him. Embrace the Holy Spirit's conviction. Look at the potential that comes from it. When the conviction of the Holy Spirit calls you into something, there is no one and there is nothing that can turn you away from His calling except you. There's no one that can stop you. No one but you. The whole world can be against you, but they cannot hold you back if you still have His conviction within you. Because He'll guide you and He'll lead you into making the right decisions. Conviction is His promise to you that it is not over yet. If He's still convicting, He's not done. And you're not done. It doesn't matter what we've done. If He's still convicting us, it's His way of letting you know it's not over yet. It's His pledge that He's not finished with you. The reluctant soul says to the Holy Spirit's conviction, I will tomorrow. Hmm. In 2 Corinthians 6, 2, the Holy Spirit is still saying, no, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Now is the appointed time. Now is the acceptable time. Amen? Amen. 
God goes after the human heart with conviction and chastening because He loves us. God turns us in a different direction and speaks with us. He gives us a message for right now. Why? Because He wants to use us right now. Amen? Amen. Does there ever come a time when conviction comes to an end? It would seem that there will be a day. Genesis 6.3 in the days of Noah, God said that His Spirit would not always strive with men. And you see in their day that it came to an end. It came to a close in Noah's day where He flooded the earth. He destroyed everything that was not in the ark. Animals, people, giants, and whatever ungodly creatures there were in that day. 1 Peter 3.20 1 Peter 3.20 I guess I need to back up a little bit. Verse 19 By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Talking about Jesus. Which sometime were disobedient when once when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So we see where he was long suffering in that day, but his long suffering, the length of the suffering, came to an end. And so it's going to happen again. He's still going to rain. He's going to destroy the earth with rain, but it's going to be the rain of fire. He's going to burn all the elements. Peter, Peter says that too. He says he's going to destroy all the elements of earth. Everything, every metal, every alloy, everything, everything unimaginable that could possibly be destroyed by fire. It will be destroyed by fire. But the conviction of the Holy Spirit is still here. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is still dealing with men and women's hearts to bring them to a place of total surrender. Conviction, thank God, is the Holy Spirit's constant tool. He's patient and He's persistent. He does not tire easily. Why does He not tire easily? Because it's a God thing. Because the Holy Spirit is God. And what He does, there is no tire. There is no weariness in what He does. The conviction of the Holy Spirit comes by commission. And its mission has been authorized by God. If you'll stand with me. This is the shortest message I've ever preached in my life. It's a miracle. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. And thank you for your conviction, Lord. I just ask, Lord God, that you would just minister to each and every one of us here in this building and those who are on Facebook. I just pray, Lord, that you would just deal with their hearts by the great and mighty power of your Holy Spirit. We know, Lord God, that you have a purpose and a plan for our lives. We know, Lord, that your purpose is always to turn us to the cross of Jesus Christ. It is always to bring us to a place of surrender and to kneel at the foot of what Jesus did over a thousand, thousands of years ago. And we thank you for what you did, Jesus. And I'm asking God that you would just do a work, Lord God, and go into the depths of people's hearts, Lord God, to minister. I ask, Lord God, where there's people who need healing. I'm asking, Lord God, where there's those who need to surrender to Jesus. We know that you died on the cross, Lord God, so that we could be saved, so that we could be washed in the blood, so that we could have redemption. And Lord God, we thank you, Lord, that by the blood of Jesus Christ, there is redemption, there is remission of sins, there's forgiveness. We thank you for the flesh of your body that you laid down on that cross. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you allow them to tie you to the whipping post, to take the stripes across your back with that whip, to tear and to rip the shreds of flesh out of your back. We thank you, Lord, that you received the crown of thorns in your head, Lord. You took the torture. You took the hor horrifying humility of being stripped naked before the world that day. And you did it so that we could be saved. And I'm asking God that by the power of the Holy Spirit's conviction, that those who are being dealt with, Lord God, that you would minister to them and that you would bring them to a place of total surrender today. 
And I'm asking Jesus as they call on the name of Jesus that they would accept you and that they would receive you. And those who are away from Jesus and those who need to be re repent of their sins, who need to make things right, I'm asking God that you would get a hold of their hearts as they call out on the name of Jesus. You said that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be delivered, shall be healed. And I'm asking, Lord, for salvation, that healing and deliverance would be given today, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord. We just give you the glory and we give you the honor and the thanks and the praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.